Okay, hi everyone. Uh, yeah, full room, uh, so I'll take a picture with you. Please smile, everybody, because my colleagues just love uh, me sending pictures of everybody with you. Uh, so, <laughs> smile, wave, whatever. Put your hand up. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, um, so, lunch was good. Um, I'm Philip, I'm from Vienna, um, capital of schnitzels actually, so I was surprised to have schnitzels here as well. And yeah, Vienna is also well known for its architecture, pretty classical and beautiful women. <laughs> or probably not so much. Um, yeah, so don't worry, I know it's right after lunch, everybody is sleepy, uh, we'll keep this pretty light-hearted and I'll just make fun of technology and we won't do any hard stuff. Okay, so uh, I work at Elastic, I'm in the infrastructure team, so we provide our own internal tooling, we do the stuff like Docker, Jenkins, uh, Amazon, whatever people need us to do, and I'm also out a lot to speak at conferences, like in Tallinn. And when I'm back at home, I organize meetups, one about databases in general, and one more about the theoretical side of stuff, so we read papers and discuss them. Yes, so, any confessions before we get started? Like, do you want to tell something to the audience or is just everybody relaxing and leaning back and we'll think about our general sins, your sins, whatever? Okay, so let's get started. Uh, seven deadly sins, uh, which one is that? Right, gluttony. The overindulgence and overconsumption of everything to the point of waste. Um, which is, first off, add all the dependencies. Um, so, I don't know how many of you are programming in Java, who's programming in Java? Okay, yes, many, many big uh, dependencies. Uh, the problem with that is you might run off out of Permian space or Metaspace if you're on Java 8 and above. Uh, and there are two problems with that. So, yeah, memory, and also if you continuously deploy your stuff, you need to transfer that stuff and you need to store it somewhere. So, really big dependencies or war on jar files are not so nice. So, what do you do if you're too fat? You put yourself on a diet. Uh, and one example for would be uh, if you're using Amazon. Uh, Amazon previously had one big fat jar for everything they did. And so if you needed to access a single service from Amazon, you would need to pull in a 13 megabyte dependency. Um, so just for using one single server, 13 megabytes of additional dependencies for every jar or file you built, which was not really ideal. And at some point they realized, yep, that's too much, and they have now split it up and you have one base char file, which is super small, and then you have the independent models, you, whatever you want to use. Uh, which would look something like that, you just define the general version, what you want to include, and then you can just say, yes, I need this one dependency, and I'm probably adding like half a megabyte or something like that, instead of the full 13 megabytes. So yes, this is kind of the first step, do this, keep everything small and contained. Uh, but of course, uh, you can overdo this. Who's using Node or NPM? Anybody? Uh, yeah, so left pad and stuff like that, you can just yeah, make a module for every single dependency, uh, which is also not the ideal solution. So like, try to find the right balance. Uh, and the next thing is uh, combine all the projects, which is, of course, microservices. Uh, but I'm not talking about like going too much into the microservice direction, but also like taking a step back and think about, do we really need to do all the services? Like at the moment, I feel like, yes, we've had microservices, but now we are switching over to nano services, Pico, Femto, Atto, Yocto services. And Yocto is the smallest thing I could find. So once you've reached Yocto services, you're uh, perfect. It's just like one single function per microservice, which might overdo it a little. So, um, just to visualize that, uh, this is what theory looks like, which looks kind of okay and nice, and this is what practice then looks like. And this is probably less nice, depending on your taste. Uh, but I'm always wary of like microservices which get into this really thinny thing. And this is the only cool thing that came out of Gartner, the hype cycle, or which are, at least they're always pushing. And I'm still not sure where we are with microservices. Maybe we're up 
at the peak of inflated expectations. And uh, some have my, may maybe even fallen down already, and some might have reached the plateau of productivity again. Uh, but it always depends. So you will need to decide for yourself where uh, you are at the moment. So yes, generally, I would say it helps if you have too many people, uh, if you have too many dependencies, one big ball of mud, or if you need to scale your different services independently. Absolutely, it does help. If you have these problems, use them. Uh, but will it solve all your problems? Unfortunately, I'm not so sure about that. Um, so you know, may, most of you will have seen that eight fallacies of distributed computing. Uh, stuff in a distributed system will go wrong and it will bite you at some point. Also like Twitter, everybody remembers the fail whale which used to be a very common thing like a few years ago, and they have learned it like the hard way, like failing every few weeks. Nowadays it's very uncommon, but it was a very painful process through which they have gone through. Uh, and this blog post, Notes on Distributed Systems for Young Bloods, by Jeff Hodges, who was a long time on their team, uh, just describes like all the things that can go wrong and will go wrong. Uh, and the main takeaway is distributed systems are different, not because of latency or anything, but because independent services will fail independently and they will fail often and you need to take care of that. And this is just more work you actually need to do. So keep in mind, uh, if you want to pay that price, does it really, is it really worth it paying for it? And then there are people saying, yeah, so I done right, and I'm kind of agreeing, yeah, no more XML. And uh, there was this thing called WS Death Star, uh, where you had a web service standard for like every single thing, like WS transaction, WS security, whatever, and every big vendor had like their own solution. Yes, this was bad, and we've left this behind. Uh, but yes, stuff didn't all get easier. So I guess most of you will recognize this. Who's using Wireshark? Um, very nice. The only problem is, as long as you have a single server, yeah, capture the packets and, and fire up Wireshark. Uh, if you have microservices and one single request touches like 10 services on probably 20 different servers, uh, which packages do, do you capture and how do you fire up your Wireshark? So this is like one of the costs you will face. You need totally different tooling. Like everybody is used to Wireshark, uh, but if you go like the full microservice approach and split up everything over many, many servers, you need additional tooling for that. So that's uh, another cost you need to keep in mind. Um, so there's this nice thing, we replaced our monolith with a microservice so that everything, so, uh, outage could be more like a murder mystery uh, because like, you have now many possible suspects and you need to trace it through the entire system. Yes, and coming back to Star Wars, um, yes, this is the Death Star, uh, but what could this be? This is actually two microservices and their main shared database, <laughs> which is like, yes, the the Starfighters on their own are pretty sweet and nice, but without their Death Star, there's not too much point to them. So if you have this big monolithic database, uh, you've kind of like, yeah, you have nice services in front of them, but you still have this big monolith in your system which you depend upon. Uh, so some people say, don't even think about microservices uh, because they're just too complex. Uh, start off with your monolith because it will help you. And yeah, still pay attention to the proper design to do it right. This is Martin Fowler. Um, yeah, and many people say, yeah, this is like the stack we used in 2005, which is kind of what you could keep in your head. And this is what we would do in 2016. And probably nobody can keep that in your head. And I probably won't need to tell you about the added complexity of this. And some people still manage to run stuff with pretty much like this, small little sites like Stack Overflow, who are pretty much on the Microsoft stack and are very much against both cloud and like microservices, they, th they say with their small team, they can just can manage everything better that way. So it might depend on what you're doing. And probably we just need to find a nicer way for microservices. So for uh, for monolith. So if you call monolith a mega platform, Uber containers or stereolith, uh, they would probably be much cooler again. So it will probably take two or three more years, but then one of these names will establish and everybody will be cool uh, just by doing the big thing with the cool name again. Yeah. So 
And just like to complete this, yes, microservices are very nice. They're small, simple. You can keep them in your head. It's just like so much easier. The problem is the complexity deduction doesn't vanish. You just push it down. And you push it down to the integration layer. You will need to decide for yourself if that is really worth it. Uh, but the complexity, unfortunately, doesn't really vanish. So everybody repeat after me. I'm not Amazon, I'm not Google, I'm not Facebook. Um, just because they're doing that successfully probably doesn't mean you will be successful with that. But we'll come back to that. Um, yeah, next up, greed. That's pretty easy to spot. Um, uh, the excessive or rapacious desire and pursuit of material possessions. And I have just a single slide for that. And yeah. <laughs> Everybody probably remembers those days, right? So for me, it was like, I don't know, seven years ago or so. JBoss would take like five minutes to start up, and the redeploy would take two minutes. And after five redeploys, uh, you would run out of memory, and you would need to restart again. And it was just very, very painful. I mean, I'm sure now it's Wildfly. It's much faster, much nicer. Uh, but still, I'm not a big fan of these big uh, application servers. Uh, which will manage everything for you. I'm more on the keep it leaner, uh, don't throw everything in your application server. Okay, next up, what do we have here? What's the sin? Sloth, exactly. Uh, physical laziness, but also spiritual laziness. And I think we can go pretty quickly over that because we've covered that already, like we have the continuous whatever. So. Starting off with continuous integration, everything you pu push to your version control, I assume everybody uses proper version control, uh, you build and test. The next step would be continuous delivery, that you actually automatically build your artifacts, but you still manually need to intervene to deploy them to production at least. Uh, to development, it might be automated. And kind of the final step would be continuous deployment, where you actually automatically deploy to production. And hopefully you can roll back automatically if you break your stuff. Um, that's, of course, nice to have. And the overall picture is like, uh, if you want to throw around all the buzzwords you have and want to impress your management, yes, first off, you need agile development, because this is kind of the basis everything else rests upon. Then you can just integrate continuously that you test the stuff at least. Uh, continuous delivery, just you release it and actually deploy it probably to development, but not production. And then continuous deployment, just put it out on production. And to top it off, you have DevOps, which is the whole thing. It's just like automate everything. You build it, you run it, whatever you want to call it. Uh, my only problem is like, is it really a requirement? I would always say, again, it depends. It's like, not everybody needs to reach that goal to be successful. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. And again, I love Jenkins. Uh, the only thing I don't like about Jenkins is that sometimes I don't like it. Uh, so for example, sometimes uh, Jenkins is a Jerkins uh, that is failing on purpose. Sometimes it's Jenkins because it's just you're incompetent. Uh, and sometimes it's Jenkins uh, because there is no real reason for whatever it is. But I still like it. Uh, the two, my two <coughs> features I like most is you can, again, if you're in the Java ecosystem, you can do your releases there. So you simply have one click, and it will automatically take your snapshot version, um, change that to the release version you want, push your artifact out, tag your commit, and then change it up to the next snapshot version, and that is all done automatically by Jenkins for you. It will make sure all the tests are green, otherwise it won't do that, uh, and you don't need to manually intervene for that. So this is one very nice thing. If you like releases at some point, Jenkins can do that for you. And the second thing, if you still want to have some manual control over your production deployments, uh, there's something called uh, pr the promotions plugin, where you can simply say if some condition is met, or if you click a button, only then something is promoted, for example, to production or to development or wherever you want to go. And again, it's just like one click from Jenkins, uh, and it's super easy to get that. The other two things I want to mention, first off, separate your code and configuration. Um, 
For example, I roll my artifact I want to deploy, and at some point I see, okay, my SSL certificate is running out, and I need to renew that. And probably I don't want to re-roll my application just because I want a new SSL certificate, or my certificate gets compromised, or I change something in my overall uh, project infrastructure. I don't want to re-roll all my artifacts just to be able to do that. So if you have your code, and your configuration, of course, both uh, in version control. Separate those two so you don't have any issues yet. You change one, and then you need to re-roll the whole thing. Just keep them nice and separated. And the other thing is, like, never ever commit, especially your AWS credentials, because there are many, many stories where people just thought, yeah, this is just a personal project. I'll just commit my AWS keys to this little project. And half a year later, they decide, hey, this is actually cool. I'll open source it. And then some bad guy finds your credentials and starts spinning up expensive machines just to mine bitcoins. And the bad thing about that is Amazon is not really uh, perfect for that because you will probably spend like $1,000 of mining bitcoins to actually get out something like $10. But if it's somebody else's money, you can still totally do that. And many, many people will do it. And Amazon is actually actively scanning GitHub now for AWS credentials. Uh, just to block that because it's such a common problem, uh, but it's still like an arms race and you don't want to be in the middle of that. Okay, coming up next, uh, do you recognize that? It's a little dark. Um, last, it's the intense and, and uncontrolled desire. And in IT, uh, it's normally always use the hottest shit. Uh, and yes, so let's switch over to Docker. Yes, Docker and containers are super nice um, because it works on my machine. That's the one problem I'm sure Docker solves. So if you have this problem that stuff you build and test locally and then in development and then in production just behaves differently because of some weird circumstance or because you're doing, I don't know, you have complex dependencies or anything, yes, Docker will probably save you. But again, if you don't have this problem, uh, Docker won't probably save you. I mean, I've always, everybody has this colleague, right? It's, it's working on my machine, and it's working on my machine. And I've had this guy, and at some point I just told him, yes, right, okay, back up your email, your laptop is now going to production. Because this is probably the, the only system where this shit is working. Uh, and yeah, so if you have this problem, Docker can help you. But otherwise, I always have the feeling like, this is what Docker gives you. So you have everything like nicely separated, uh, but this is not really an entire system, and this is not really solving the full problem you have, I assume. Um, so yes, uh, containers will not fix your broken architecture. You're welcome. Uh, because stuff might look something like this. So just think of each of these containers like a Docker container. So each container on their own is doing pretty well, I would say, but it's just like, the overall thing is not doing that well. Um, so this is like what Docker gives you and also kind of the shortcoming Docker might run, you might run into with. So yes, you, you probably need something fancy around it just to make it all work in combination together. And yes, there is stuff, uh, I don't know, Mesosphere, Kubernetes, whatever. But again, it's a lot of complexity. If it's solving your problem, great. If it's not solving your problem, eh, yeah, it's just more work. And there are, then there are the little things, like glibc. There was a bad vulnerability like a few months ago in glibc, and you had your nice containers, um, but you would still need to patch all your containers in a quick way. Uh, so you would re need to re-image all of them. So how is that going? So without something like proper automation, this is still a major pain. And I know now people will say, no, there is stuff like Alpine Linux where there is no glibc because it has its own library, which is much smaller and much nicer. But for example, this is something at Elastic, which we uh, are currently still not sure how to tackle because the Oracle JDK at least requires glibc and OpenJDK, just a runtime environment, can live without glibc, uh, but the JDK, again, needs glibc. So you're probably screwed without glibc. Or it, again, it's just like additional test overhead, and by removing one problem, getting rid of big, old, bad glibc, you're getting into a new problem set. And it's just like trading one pain for another pain. And then I'm, I'm not sure who has seen that. Hitler uses Docker. 
which is pretty fun. I, I won't show you the full video. It's just like three or four minutes. Watch it at home. It's super funny. Uh, and like this is the most obvious question. Um, who is actually using Docker in production here? Anybody? Okay, two hands, three, okay. Yeah, like this is the, the common thing, like, yeah, we use, use it locally and we use it for development, but actually uh, for production, I'm not so sure. And I always feel like, but the whole point is to have that one container and push it through all your stages. And if you're not actually going to production with it, why are you even doing it? Why are you testing something different than you're running in production? And then there's this like turtles all the way down, you can run, Docker on GCE, on VM, on Borg, and you can just like put it on all the different layers and it's, yeah, you can do it, but should you do it, um, I never know. Uh, and I'm always comparing this like microservices plus container, this combination is kind of a cargo cult. And Dilbert obviously says it best, like the cargo cult is like, you copy the strategy of a successful company and you just copy one little piece of that and take it over and then you think you will be just as successful. So for example, if the big successful companies are also doing golf tournaments, only do golf tournaments because then you will be super successful. Uh, but that's not really the way it's working. And I'm kind of more taking a pragmatic approach again. Java world, uh, yes, Josh Long is always saying that make Java not war, so he's coming from the Spring ecosystem. Um, He's pretty much against containers, just make little, small, self-contained uh, jar files, which you can run without an application server, and you have pretty much everything you need, because I don't really need Docker. I need just one specific version of the JDK. I know that it's good. I put that JDK on my Amazon machines, and then I'll just deploy my jar file, and that contains all my dependencies. And that's much more lightweight than a container, and much, more, much easier to use for security updates, and I just need to throw around my jar file, but not the full uh, container with all its dependencies. Okay, next up, pride. Believing one is essentially better than others, which for me comes down to, I don't need to monitor my stuff because it's perfect anyway. And there, it's just like two tools. Uh, who's using New Relic? Okay. Um, I've used New Relic in the past. Uh, I'm not sure it's a perfect service, uh, but one thing it's doing nicely, if you're an Amazon, uh, the middle tier of New Relic is free. You just need to write in and say, hey, I'm on AWS, and you get the middle tier, uh, which is normally something like 45 bucks per server per month or something for free, which is super nice, because free is very hard to beat. And the service I actually would prefer is Datadog. Who uses Datadog? Okay, <laughs> some people are using all the tools. Um, and Datadog is also like, it has an agent, you can install it into your operating system, it will monitor both your virtual machine and you have agents uh, into your applications for all the different programming languages and you can just extract metrics and visualize that. And for Datadog, for example, the AWS integration is also very nice. You just have the overview of your whole system, like all the AWS components, uh, and you just get the very complete picture and you even can uh, gather your custom metrics and it looks really nice. A uh, bit nicer than New Relic, who I think is, yeah, interface is kind of clunky. Okay, what is this? Not Kevin Spacey. <laughs> um, what is the sin? Anybody knows? Um, envy. The discontent toward someone's traits, status, abilities, or rewards. Which is, first off, craft everything yourself. Uh, I'm sure everybody has the co a colleague who has this not invented here syndrome. Um, because luckily I have never worked with one, but I knew one. And he, he's also fi called Philip, but it's not me. Uh, and he's using Java and he has, he's writing his own Philip libraries. So I, I guess everybody knows Apache Commons, and see, he has Philip Commons. And he has like, Philip everything. He has Philip serialization, Philip security, Philip whatever. And he has like 50 different uh, projects he has started. And the problem is, once you have him in your team, he will just add all his dependencies, and once you're, he's gone, you're stuck with his shitty dependencies. So don't be that guy, don't do it. Uh, if you're in the Java ecosystem, 
I strongly believe in the uh, in Spring Boot at the moment, which is you just have one interface. You just say I don't want the Maven or Gradle file in a specific version. Uh, you put in your group names and artifacts name, and I think say I have a web project and I need security and I need whatever are the tools I need. For example, I don't know, Hibernate, JPA, whatever, and it will just generate you one dependency file with a known set of dependencies that are working well together and with all the stuff set up properly like logging uh, and you can just download it and start that within minutes. You don't need a, a servlet container, it has everything itself uh, contained so you can just start that um, from the command line once you've downloaded all the dependencies which might take some time. But it's still a very nice and standardized way and it's pretty much the same in every project and it's just a very sane point to start and quick. Like, I once used to work in the PHP world and everybody was bashing the Java world because they said like you need to set up XML files for three days. And it's just not true anymore. You can start your projects in like three minutes and it's just working. And the other thing is pets versus cattle. I assume not all of you are fami familiar with that, so if you have a server, uh, previously what many people would do is they would treat it like a pet. So you would give it a name and you would raise it by hand and if it was sick you would care for it and you would make it better again. Uh, which is the pet approach, which was nice, but that A doesn't really scale and B it's often like again, the murder mystery, searching for mysterious bugs, and you can never reproduce that. So now we have more of the kettle approach. Um, so kettle don't have a specific name. Uh, kettle are not really raised by hand. And if uh, one of your livestock is ill, you actually kill it, so it doesn't infest the rest of your stock. And this is kind of the more modern automated approach. Uh, don't care for specific servers, just have everything automated and have everything set up automatically and you don't really need to care for your pets anymore. Um, so I like Ansible. Uh, Ansible can kind of do all the things for you. So it can configure Amazon for you, you can say okay, this is my, the network setup I want to use, this is the instance size and region where I want to have instances, I want to have this relational database and I want to have this these S3 buckets or whatever you want to set up, it can do that for you. It can provision your instances, just install a specific version of JDK, um, install all the latest security bug updates, uh, install log rotate or anything else you would need on that instance. And since it's push based, it can very easily push out your applications to your application service. Uh, and it would all do all that for you, just a single tool, uh, just one thing on the command line you need to use. Uh, and it will just work. So I'm pretty much in the automate all the things. So this is the only like all the things which is I think positive. I'm really believing in automation. Don't do everything by yourself. Uh, we're all lazy. We don't want to work. Just automate yourself away and yeah, have more free time. Okay, Brad Pitt. What's the sin? Uh, wrath also known as rage, uh, hatred and anger. So I always feel like hatred and anger if stuff goes wrong and stuff breaks in an unexpected way. Um, so the first thing you should always do is to log. And this is where Elastic comes into play. Uh, like already in the keynote we saw uh, Elk stack for in-depth monitoring. Uh, Unfortunately, we kind of had to rename it like everybody knew Elk, but it's now just called the Elastic Stack because we have added Beats. And at one point, uh, we tried to actually call it Belk. So we had the logo was a B and it had the Elk horns and that was the Belk. But the Belk didn't really work, so we just renamed it to Elastic Stack. Um, so what you have is Beats, which is kind of a very lightweight agent which runs, runs on your server and collect, collects different metrics like log files, system metrics, network packets, it can analyze all of those. And then you can either insert the data directly into Elasticsearch where it will be stored and indexed, or you can forward your stuff to Logstash, which will enrich the data. Like enrichment would be you have IP addresses in your logs and it will automatically fetch the country for the IP address. So it would know, okay, you're coming from Estonia and you don't need 
to store that. Uh, you don't need to look that up uh, on demand. You could just store that information, and then you could just look up all the visitors coming from Estonia. And then you have Kibana on top, which is kind of the window into your data where you can explore your data, and you can also visualize the logs and see what is actually going on. So this is the logging approach. And this is what Kibana then, for example, looks like. So you have the visitors of your site, and you see how much data they have transferred. So this is just like a custom uh, dashboard you have put together with all the different information stored in Elasticsearch. And management just loves dashboard overviews. And you can put them on big TV screens, and everybody will be super happy. And the next thing is collect. Hopefully, you're using proper logging. And there's this tool, Sentry. Who is using Sentry? OK, very few. Uh, Sentry is actually pretty awesome. So it integrates into many different uh, logging tools. And it will know, OK, this is one specific error that is popping up again and again. And it will automatically ad aggregate them. So here you have, for example, error processing to Python on type something. And you can see uh, it happened eight times. And it affected six users, because you have the user ID. And then you can actually assign it to somebody in the team. You see when did it happen the last time, or how often did it happen over a specific time frame. And then people can fix it. And this is, I think, the sanest way to keep the overview of how your application is misbehaving. And you don't need to wade through all your logs, but you just get the, all the exceptions you have aggregated. And there is an version in the cloud you can just pay for, or you can try to run it yourself. So it's all open source, and it's pretty nice. OK, just to conclude, there are some things. I hope you've discovered yours, or you know you're either doing too much or too little in some areas. Uh, we can talk about the specifics uh, later on. Um, if you have forgotten most of what was uh, 7 all about, there is an 8-bit cinema version, which is just like a few minutes long, uh, which kind of shows you what the gist of the film is. Uh, so if you have forgotten what uh, the film 7 is all about, uh, that's super nice. And I think I, I'll just take two more minutes of your time. Uh, since I'm from Elastic, I'm always showing off our stuff. So I have somewhere, no, I'm not, I need to put that on the right screen. Here we go. Um, so no, I'm not wanting you. So this is just like running locally, and I am I have one VM running here, and I see month to date all the logs that have happened. And as you can see, I sometimes start the machine up, and most of the time it's down, so it's only logging when it's up. So I did lots of stuff here, and today I restarted it, and you can see, OK, I've got lots of logs again here. And you have all the independent logs. You can actually fold it down. And then you have all the different fields where you can actually sort them. And you see where's the data coming from, which is on a virtual machine. Everything is running locally, not giving you that much information. But if you have a big distributed system, that's pretty nice to know. And then, of course, since it's using full text search, you can just uh, search through your logs. And then you want to look up, for example, in my 11,000 log messages, uh, when did I actually reboot my machine? And then it will work out sometimes. And then you can see, OK, I've rebooted this machine, obviously, three times. And it was uh, today. Was it yes, 10th? What is it today? Yeah, 10th, OK. That, that was today. Uh, you see, uh, I've rebooted the machine. And then you see, uh, on the 7th, I rebooted. And on the 4th, I was actually working pretty late at night and rebooted the machine to fix something or stuff. Uh, so you can do that. And what is probably more powerful uh, is we have a lot of dashboards. For example, um, if you want to see web transactions, if my interface was interacting with me, uh, it's just loading. It's all in one tiny VM, so it's not doing that well. So for example, you can see uh, in the last 15 minutes, I have done. 35 requests to my web application. And you can see, actually, OK, how many requests in the last, what was it, 15 minutes. I could, of course, change the time frame here and whatever time span I want. Um, the requests, uh, 
the response codes, error codes. Okay, luckily there were no error codes, and you could see actually what which one were the pages I requested most uh, stuff from. And this is packet beats, so you would just run that on the instance where your application ser uh, service or whatever web server you have, and it will, would just read out that information from your HTTP headers. So you don't need to do anything specific for any of your servers, it's just like a very lightweight agent running on your system and gathering all the metrics. And we have the same thing for um, the instance itself. Um, what I would say... Um, So how is my instance doing? So you can see the, the system load is actually currently coming down. And you see, OK, I have one server, so that's not so interesting. But you can see the memory usage. Maybe my poor little VM could use some more memory. CPU is pretty much OK. But you could, for example, see, um, OK, which process is taking how much memory? And if you have a big distributed system, all of these tools are open source. You can just run with them and gather all the metrics for free. And here you can see, for example, Elasticsearch is written in Java. So this is taking quite some memory. Node is the web interface, Kibana. And then you see PacketBeat uh, needs uh, stuff. And Ruby does is actually Logstash uh, to parse your applications. So you can, can see all the nice queries and yeah, just monitor your stuff and get a nice overview. And of course, you could again change the time frame. You can zoom in, zoom out, uh, whatever you're interested in. So for example, you could even say, I'm just interested in that time frame. And then you would narrow it down, and you would see the change. OK. Um, any questions? Any confessions? Yes. Question about the if I may. Sure. Yes. So for the, the more complex stuff and like in the re enrichment phase, uh, you would still need Logstash. So if you want to aggregate multiple sources or you have some kind of complex lookups, uh, you would still use Logstash. So we will have in the next version, already the, the version I showed that's the upcoming version where there's only an alpha version at the moment, we have something in Elasticsearch called ingest nodes, uh, where you can do some of the stuff uh, Logstash is doing. Uh, but only some of the stuff. So if Logstash is very powerful because it has, I don't know, 200 plugins or so, so it can communicate with lots of different systems, uh, only Logstash will be able to do that. And for complex aggregations and enrichment, you will still need Logstash. But many people don't like Logstash because it's Ruby and uh, it actually it's JRuby and it, Java always needs time to start up and needs resources and it's complex to run and manage. Uh, so for simple setups, you won't need it. Uh, but for more complex stuff, you will still need Logstash. And uh, how does uh, what is Beats? Uh, yes, Beats. Uh, how does currently deliver? Uh, so you mean the protocol? Uh, that's Lumberjack by default. Yep. So you can SSL encrypt it and it's by default uh, TCP. And it will uh, directly, for example, the top beat, packet beat, whatever, that is going directly into Elasticsearch. Okay, so Elasticsearch ingests uh, Lumberjack protocol. Uh, yeah, this is then just a passing. But yes, you can s uh, send with Lumberjack. You can directly communicate uh, over the wire. And Beats is written in Go. So that compiles to native binaries and is obviously, yeah faster than anything done in JRuby. Any plans to write Lumberjack in Go? Um, Lumberjack Logstash, uh, Lumberjack Logstash. Logstash. Uh, so um, at the current version uh, in Logstash, uh, some of the parts have been rewritten in native Java because it's just faster. Uh, but one of the changes we had actually to roll back uh, because it broke some stuff in weird setups, but still customers were affected. And uh, this improvement will again come in version 5, the next major release. Uh, but yes, some of the bottlenecks are being rewritten in plain Java, not in Go, but in plain Java. Uh, and that should speed up stuff also a lot. Like we have a blog post on that, so if you want to look up the numbers, you will find it. You had a question as well. Yes. Uh, because it's super expensive, I assume. It is, right? I, I, I 
I, I had a look at it once and it was just like, okay, it's so expensive I don't even care. Do, do you have any affiliation with them or yeah. you work for them? No. No, okay. It. Okay, you use it. Um, but it is expensive, right? Yes. Yeah, so. Yes, of course. Like, I'm, I'm not affiliated with any of the other tools. Uh, I'm just like showing off what I have used and what I deem kind of reasonable. And yes, AppDynamics is, I guess, a good tool. Uh, but for us, like, it definitely couldn't beat Free New Relic. And also, Datadog is $15 per server per month, which I find pretty reasonable. And I'm not sure, but AppDynamics is probably like at least 10 times more. Even more, OK. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Any confessions? So actually, this is something to take into consideration that you have to have really fast load if you use services that charge per instance or per node. And, and really fast loads are more of a surface that can fail. Of course, like I if you have like services which are very expensive per server, you have more of an urge to use big servers than many small independent ones. Even though, like, the more you distribute stuff, uh, this will also add more problems. So it's it's always yeah balance and the trade-offs. So I wouldn't say it's like uh, one extreme is right and the other extreme isn't right. It's always you need to find the right approach for you, and you will probably experience where. It the pain is for you, and you need to find, strike the right balance. But of course, if you can use free tools, uh, there's le less of an incentive to, to optimize for the cost, but more on like what makes sense for you. Anything else? No? OK. Thanks a lot.